Well, welcome. Have your seats. Happy Easter. This is Easter 2024. You are at Elam Evangelical Free Church. It is a joy to be worshiping with you on this beautiful and glorious sunny day. My name is Ryan White. I am the pastor here. And we here at Elam are a community of everyday missionaries growing in our love for God, his word, his people, and his purposes in the world. So I want to give you guys a little bit of uh, history. For thousands of years, there has been a traditional Easter greeting. We call it the Easter Acclamation, and I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. Uh, Originally, next slide there, originally we'd say it in Greek which is Christos Anesti, and then you respond, Alethos Anesti. But because most of you don't speak Greek, we're going to go a little bit modern. So if you could, stand on your feet, and it's a three-part call and response. So I'll do the leader part. You guys do the people part. You guys ready? Okay. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. And let's sing. Lift your voice.
You may be seated. Now, after the, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Please stand with us in worship. All right, guys, this is how we thank the Lord this morning, right? We thank him by singing songs of love and joy to him. So let's sing this one in celebration. Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus.
Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat for a second, but don't get too comfortable. Because I want to introduce you to one of our favorite new traditions here at Elam. We call it the decoration of the cross. Because there's this beautiful mystery at the heart of our faith that the symbol that was originally meant to represent fear and torture and death has become for us a symbol of incredible hope and new life. And so what we do on Easter is we bring fresh cut flowers and we adorn the cross. And what was once this image of ugly, dark death sprouts to new life. So as we sing, I'm going to invite you guys to come up and adorn the cross. And John, you can put up the ladders. And in fact, I'm going to invite my family up first as well. So what we'll do is we'll go this section first, then you guys, then you, and then you. Patience. But as you come, um, if you can't mount the stairs, don't worry. Be safe. Uh, But also, uh, we have, if you're feeling daring, we've got ladders that you can traverse as well. But as we come to adorn the cross, let me pray. Dear God, Lord, this is a day that we celebrate unexpected and inexplicable new life. You are a God of victory, a God who triumphs over death. And so as we come to adorn the cross, may we come in gratitude, acknowledging what is our living hope in you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's come and adorn the cross. You guys can stand and come forward. Yeah, come guys, come.
And if you did not bring a flower, there are extras here for you to put on as well. Yeah.
Please stand with us in worship. Good morning. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we come uh, to you in humble submission to first give thanks and praise for how you have brought us this far. Father, we are so grateful that you gave Beth White back to us. Because you determined her job was not yet finished. Father, you have shown your love and mercy to us time and time again. You continue to show that your love and mercy trumps any and everything the enemy of our souls throw at us. Lord God, you demonstrated your love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And now, God, through your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life, permit that we who celebrate with overwhelming joy the day of our Lord's resurrection. May we be raised from the death of sin by the same life-giving spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And may we reign with Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Good morning once again. My name is Willie. I am one of the elders here. And at this time, uh, we will hear from Linda Busick for the kids' moment. brought my helper with me. So last week in the children's ministry, we made resurrection gardens. And I said, Beth, are they going to bring them back next week so I can see them? And she said, no. So I decided to take one home. And this is what mine turned out to be. Very nice green grass. So I'm going to put this garden over here with the cross. Today, for the kids' moment, we are going to be looking into the part uh, in the Bible after Jesus' resurrection, and the disciples didn't know where he was. And this is the the account of two of them along the road to Emmaus. Scriptures found in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 11. And their words seemed unto them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed wondering in himself at which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And as they talked together of all these things which had it happened, they came to pass that while they were yet communed together and reasoned within themselves, Jesus drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said to them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one with another? As ye walk and are sad, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass these days? And he said unto them, What things? And he said unto them, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be, crucif to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we have trusted that it was he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, this day, the third day since these things that were done, yea, certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they should have not, and when they found not his body, they came, saying that these also had seen a vision of angels, which said that was he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even as so as the woman had said, but they saw him not. 
Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And as they drew nigh into the village, to get whether they went, he made though as he would have went further on. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one unto another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together with them, and saying unto them, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared unto Simon. And they told what things that they were done by the way, and he was known in them in the breaking of the bread. And as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. What I want all of us to know is how their eyes were opened and they knew him and their hearts burned within them when their eyes were opened. And I pray that each one of us here would have our eyes open to the reality of Jesus Christ as our Savior and, and that our souls would be burned with his love and to go out and and tell others ab about him. So before the kids go, I want, we're going to sing the song we sang last week. Do you remember that? We, s we said one side sang something and the other side sang something and we stood up. So I'm gonna get in front here. I'm gonna touch your head so I don't fall. And so this side will sing Allelu, Alleluia, and you stand up, remember? And this side will sing Praise Ye the Lord. And then we go back and forth, and then we're going to have all of you participate with us. Okay? So this side, let, let's start. Are you ready? This side, you got to stand up. So we'll start here over. Right there. Okay. Are you ready? Allelu, 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 alleluia. Stand up. Praise ye the Lord. Allelu, 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 alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. Keep standing. Praise ye the Lord. Alleluia. Praise ye. Lord, Alleluia, praise ye the Lord, Alleluia, everybody, praise ye the Lord, okay, now all of you are going to do it, okay, if, if you can stand up, go ahead, so this side will sing Alleluia, and this side will sing praise ye the Lord, and at the end, we all say praise ye the Lord. Okay, you ready? You got to sit down. Okay, ready? Remember, all of you on this side, ready? Allelu, 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 alleluia. Praise ye the Lord. Allelu, allelu. So before everybody goes, I'm going to give you one of the little eggs that I, for, that I forgot last week. And it has something for you to do this week. And when you come back next week on Sunday, you can share how it went, okay?
Well, thank you, Linda, and thank you, kids. As you take your eggs, you can have your seat. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, it's Easter morning, and on today, we worship our Savior, and we worship Him using one of His ancient titles, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead is a biblical expression. It occurs twice in the New Testament, once in Colossians, once in the book of Revelation. It is a name reserved exclusively for Jesus. And what does it mean to worship Jesus as the firstborn of the dead? Well, let's begin with that word first. If you look up first in the dictionary, it is a thing or person that ranks or comes at the beginning of a series. The first precedes all others in time or importance. When you say first, it implies the beginning of something. You only say first when you know there will be a second or a third. I think of my kids when my young eldest Eliana was little. She used to run through our house and everywhere when she'd get somewhere, she'd shout first. Why? Because she knew a second was coming. Her younger brother Elijah would be shortly behind her and they were racing. First has a sense of expectation built into it. It implies a new beginning. The establishment of some new reality. As Paul says in Colossians 1.18, Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. But Jesus is not merely the first, He is the firstborn. First to be brought forth or given birth to. And it speaks to more than just his status as the firstborn son of Mary. It even speaks to more than just his status as the only begotten son of God. Firstborn is a concept of great importance in Jesus' world. You read the Old Testament and you discover the firstborn son held a special place of prominence and authority within the family. He would inherit his father's place as patriarch, as the head of the family, and he would ensure the family's existence into the next generation. And with that responsibility came special status. He received his father's blessing and a double portion of the inheritance. And just listen how Jacob described his firstborn son Reuben in Genesis 49. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first fruits of my strength, Preeminent, that just means surpassing all others, in dignity, preeminent in power. And it's exactly the same sort of language Paul's using in Colossians. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. So Jesus is God's firstborn. He's first in time, first in order, first in dignity, first in authority, first in power. He's the beginning of something new, the inaugurator of a new reality, the leader and future hope of a new spiritual family. But here's where the title gets a bit strange because Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. The first to be brought forth not from some living womb, but from the realm of the dead. On that first Easter morning, scientists estimate that already at that point in history, uh, over 7 billion people had died. 7 billion souls. To give you a context, that's every living person on the planet today except the population of China. Imagine 7 billion souls snuffed out. 7 billion stories cut short. So much death and grief and tragedy. And the number has only skyrocketed since Jesus' day. Death has gotten greedy. Arthur C. Clarke in his book 2001 Space Odyssey put it this way, Behind every man now alive stands 15 ghosts, for that is the ratio by which the dead outnumber the living. 
That image holds true. There are 15 ghosts standing behind each and every one of us. And it's sobering and staggering. When you do the math, that's almost 120 billion people in the ranks of the dead. And 8 billion more doomed to die. And on one particularly brutal Friday over 2,000 years ago, Jesus added His singular life to death's grand total. And as as His body was laid in a rich man's tomb, Jesus took His place among death's gray legions. To use the language of the creed, Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. But Jesus was no ordinary man, and His death, His sacrificial Victorious death willingly laid down for humanity was no ordinary death. This is Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, the firstborn from the dead. And you know the story. The grave could not hold Him and death could not keep Him because one mightier than death is here. He tore off death's shackles. He stared death in the face. And He declared death's reign to be over. This wasn't cheating death or stealing a soul back from death. This was breaking death's power and hold over the world. A decisive blow. The first strike in Christ's inevitable victory. And after three days in death's domain, Jesus, vindicated by the Father, was raised to new life. He got up. He folded His grave clothes. See kids? Clean up your rooms. And marched out of his tomb never to die again. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And you may say this morning, well, that's great for Jesus. That was a brutal path he walked. I'm glad his story ended well. But don't forget, he is the firstborn from the dead. He's the first in a series First implies a second and a third. First implies a new beginning, some new reality, what Scripture calls new creation. So Jesus is the firstborn, the head of a new family, a family that He's gathered from those death previously claimed as its own. We are deaths no longer. And Jesus as the firstborn of the, from the dead now guarantees our future in this life and the life to come. Jesus has been raised and that is good news for us. It's good news for those who died in faith before us because our stories don't have to end in grief and tragedy. They can go on to everlasting, unquenchable life. And actually, the Easter narrative illustrates this beautifully for us. A little bit before where Willie read, Matthew informs us that Jesus' tomb was not the only tomb emptied that first Easter. In a way, the Easter story is a story of empty tombs. Plural. And the implication of this is incredible. So we're going to hop back and read just three verses from Matthew chapter 27. We read this starting in verse 50. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. He's on the cross, ready to die, and yielded up His Spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split, and the tombs also were opened. There's like almost this catastrophic natural phenomenon that accompanies Jesus' death. It's this symbol that this is no ordinary man and His death is no ordinary death. It is as if creation itself is shaking in mourning with His passing. So there's this big earthquake when Jesus dies. and Earthquakes aren't that uncommon in Israel, but this one was huge. It damaged the temple. It split rocks. It broke open the stone graves that ring the ancient city of Jerusalem. It's some serious shaking. But things only get weirder from here. 
And the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Well, that is weird. Dead people who had been dead for a long time got up, shook off the dust, <clears throat> did a few kind of lung-clearing coughs, and started walking around. What do we do with that? Well, this is what we call theology in narrative form. You want to know what Jesus' resurrection means for you? God says, okay, I will provide you with a case study. Consider these guys. So Matthew calls these men and women saints. They were the holy people who had died. But remember, holy just means set apart. These are people who set themselves apart for God, choosing to live their life for Him and His purposes. And they died trusting God, placing their hope in Him. And when Jesus rose from the dead, it is as if resurrection life burst out of the grave with Him. And it overflowed to the benefit of those who had placed their trust in God. So when He rose from the dead, they woke up too with a new lease on life, and I'm sure they were as shocked as we are that they were back. So what do they do? They get up. They go into the city. They start talking to people. I'd imagine they're hungry. Probably got a bite to eat. But it says they appeared to many. And that Greek word has a couple different nuances. It could mean they made clear to many. They explained to many. They presented evidence to many. Well, evidence of what? Explained what? What Jesus' resurrection means for those who trust Him. And the Apostle Paul, he put it this way in Romans 6, 4, we were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul's thinking of baptism. When a Christian stands up to declare their allegiance to Jesus, it's that tangible moment when you say to all the world, I have received the sacrifice that He has given on my behalf, and I'm choosing to trust Him and love Him and follow Him the rest of my days. And we baptize people because it's the symbolic representation that we are sharing in Christ's death and resurrection. We're participating in His story. Jesus' story is becoming our story. When a baptized person goes under the water, they're symbolically buried, sharing in His death and His victory over sin and His triumph over evil. Paul describes it this way, we know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin may be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for he who has died has been set free from sin. You see, we're like those saints in the tomb. We've died. We've died to sin. We've been set free from our past. Evil no longer has a hold over our lives. But that's not all. When we come out of the water, we're raised to walk in newness of life. We're like those saints who rose from their graves that first Easter morning. We've been given a new lease on life. We share in a strength that's not our own. In fact, we had the very resurrection life, the Holy Spirit surging through us. And that's the beauty of those, this picture. Those long dead saints had placed their hope in God. They'd identified with Him. They'd chosen to follow Him. They gave Him their allegiance. And in return, in exchange, God shares His abundant unquenchable life. Romans 8.11 If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. And that's the exact same message which we see in these folks that rose from their tombs that first Easter morning. They experience in miniature what is true for all of us. But one lingering question, what happened to those folks who rose with Jesus on Easter? Well, it seems like their situation was a little different from Christ's. 
Jesus was resurrected never to die again, they were most likely resuscitated, brought back to life, and eventually did die again. Well, you might say, dying twice sounds like a bummer. But I imagine when they faced death a second time, they faced it without fear because death's sting had been removed. They knew Jesus, the one who triumphed over death. They knew Jesus, the one who was the resurrection and the life. So when death again came knocking, they rested in hope, knowing that his resurrection secured their resurrection. God had raised Jesus from the dead, so he would raise them from the dead, never to die again. It's the beautiful promise of Easter. Life and strength for today confidence, and hope for tomorrow. But it would be remiss of me if we ended this Easter message without an invitation. The beauty, power, and hope of Easter is only worthwhile if you share in it. Easter is a great story, but it means nothing if it doesn't become your story. Jesus, as the firstborn from the dead, wants to become the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. He wants the empty tomb not to just be a marker of His victory, but a marker of your victory. The guarantee that not only will you be one day raised to new life, but that even now you can experience God's abundant life. Today, Jesus wants to see us born from the dead. And all we have to do is trust Him. So as we wind up, I'm going to invite Janelle forward. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You may be here and you don't consider yourself a Christian. I would say that it might be time to pause and consider what you actually believe about Jesus. Jesus moved heaven and earth to assure a fresh start for you. He makes amends for your poor choices and the poor choices of others, dying on a cross for our forgiveness. And He wants to rescue you and thwart all that seeks to destroy you, both within and without. And He did it all because He loves you. He is your Creator and your biggest fan, and He wants to see you walk in newness of life. He invites you to live in a close relationship with Him. He's done all the heavy lifting, the dying and the rising again. He simply invites for you to trust Him. To confess your need, to believe He is who He says He is, and to follow where He leads. You see, Jesus did not come to make bad men good or good men better. He came to make dead men alive. Jesus says, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of God, the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live. Do you want to pass from death to life? Well, hear and respond to Jesus' invitation. Believe him, receive him, and let him make you new. So do your favor to yourself. Before you race off to brunch or your egg hunt or to watch the March Madness games, take some time to wrestle with all of this. Maybe put it on your calendar for this week. Get a cup of coffee and schedule an hour where you can think and process through these things. If you would like me or one of the elders or one of the staff to be there with you to chat and talk, we'd love to do that. But maybe you're past that point. Maybe you're ready to say yes, to have a break with the old and say yes to new life, to be born from the dead. I would encourage you to say yes today. What a wonderful opportunity to say yes to new life on Easter. We can baptize you as early as next week if you'd like. But if you're ready to say yes today to new life in Jesus, would you be so brave as to raise your hands, and I will pray with you. I extend a a tangible invitation because we're all on a spiritual journey. 
We're investigating, exploring, trying to navigate, but we hit these fork in the road moments where we have to make a concrete decision. Left or right, do I take this path or not? Do I trust this way or not? Well, today may be such a moment for you, a time of choosing. So if you're choosing new life in Christ today, raise your hand and let us pray. Dear God, Lord, we come to you, firstborn from the dead. And we say yes to new life. Death has its hold on us, God. We are broken. We do what we don't want to do. Our bodies break down. But you have come that we might have life and have it abundantly. And it is freely given, so we freely receive We trust you are who you say you are. And we look to you for hope. Forgive us. Save us. Make us new, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the rest of the worship team up. As as those of you who are Christians here, you're not off the hook either. Consider the empty tombs of Easter. Know that he is the firstborn from the dead and he wants to be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. Newness of life is yours in Christ. Don't act like you're stuck or powerless or without hope. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. He gives strength to you in your weakness. He breathes life into what is dying. He wants you to thrive. The old has passed Let the new be born. Jesus wants to see you victorious, buoyed and dependent on his power, living as his everyday missionaries, his hands of feet and blessing in the world. So stand to your feet. I want to give you guys this benediction this Easter. We are Easter people. We are empty tomb people. We are born from the dead people. Let's live like it and let's glory in our Savior Jesus, the firstborn from the dead. Amen? Well, let's respond to our Savior with singing because this is a glorious day.
poppers. Here we go. You guys are going to help me count down from five, okay? Okay. 